Say hello to my creative kindred spirit, Colby Bloom. She's maybe better known as This Writing Desk on Instagram and TikTok. We honestly have very different artistic styles. I mean, kind of like polar opposite, but our artist hearts couldn't be more similar. She believes that watercolor beginners don't stay beginners for long. She fights against the fear we face each time we sit to paint. And she's definitely a watercolor joy chaser like all of us here. Her new book, Stunning Watercolor Seascapes, is all about easy, beginner-friendly seascapes. And today, I am so ready to be taught by Colby. I've thought a lot about what palette makes sense for this project because we all know I hoard watercolor supplies. And honestly, I decided to get my M. Graham watercolor pigments out after years of not using them. But friends, use what you have and be happy about it. I'm just insane with the watercolor collecting. And of course, I couldn't resist adding a few or a bunch of new colors to my M. Graham palette. So are you ready to put this palette together with me? Last year sometime, I discovered Adventurous Art Supply on Etsy and I kind of fell in love. It's a really curious shop and basically she supplies us with inserts so that we can turn our vintage tins into really high functioning watercolor palettes. So I picked up a few, and this particular one has been sitting around unused for far too long. Now, I'll be honest, I'm a little concerned because these wells are small, and M. Graham is notorious to be a softer set watercolor, even when it's technically fully cured. But I'm gonna put a small amount in these and just see what happens. And honestly, if M. Graham isn't a good fit for this palette, I'll use up what's in here and then move on and put something else in it later on. The other limitation I'm a little bit concerned about with the tininess of these wells, oh my gosh, there's another word I made up, tininess. Anywho, you're not gonna be able to easily get bigger brushes into these wells, but I think it still could work. And honestly, it's sometimes these type of limitations that actually make a supply a really strong contender as an art for joy sake maker. And what do I mean by that? There are certain supplies, combination of materials, or even the unique ways that we use them that force us to surrender to the limitations of the supplies and ultimately create the most amazing happy accidents. Yes, nod to our dear Bob Ross. So for example, these wells in this palette are so tiny that when I put my brush in one, I might bump up to another color, but then my brush is loaded with two colors and who knows what kind of crazy beautiful might happen because of that. Let me tell you a little story about M. Graham. I feel like M. Graham doesn't get the attention it deserves in the artist slash professional grade conversation. Not sure if it's just marketing or lack thereof, or the fact that they're a bit more pricey when you compare to Daniel Smith or Windsor and Newton and the like. They are honey-based, Northwest Blackberry honey to be specific, and therefore they don't ever totally cure, at least in my experience, to the hard surface of Windsor and Newton, for example. I wouldn't necessarily travel with these because you could imagine if you tipped a travel palette full of honey-based watercolors, they might start to drip. But then again, I've heard from many who do travel with these with no issue. The honey content is amazing because it allows for the purest, strongest colors possible. All right, time to dive into Colby's Scandinavian seascape scene, and I'm really excited about it. I chose this one specifically because it's full of a lot of saturated color, and it just seemed to really suit me and my color-loving personality. All right, let's get into it. Step number one is the sky, and friends, we are gonna wet the entire page. I don't want to say lightly, but I also do it's a little bit more than light and well, here's the thing. Wet your page so it glistens, but there aren't any puddles. You want the moisture on this page to be nice and even. I did start out by spraying my page just to kind of make things easier, but you could certainly just apply the water with a brush. Starting at the top, I am using a little bit of Payne's Gray and I'm just adding that color starting from the top and carrying it down. I'm dabbing in the color, anything to get it on the page. Honestly, at this point, how you apply it 
really doesn't matter. We are gonna smooth it out soon, but your page is damp, so it's gonna blendy blend very easily as long as your page is damp enough. Now, one thing, this is a new paper I'm using, and I gotta say, it picked up the pigment a little bit unevenly, and I was kind of bummed about that, but you know, we make it work. You're going to be working only in the top two thirds of the paper at this point. Top two thirds, you really wanna leave that bottom third alone. So gradually you're going to just let that color blend out and fade away as you enter into the middle third of the page. Add a little bit more of the paint gray at the top to kind of get that more intense color, that ombre, that gradation from top to the middle of the page. Next, I love this, get a little bit of paper towel, wrap it around your finger, a couple fingers, and you're going to, with a decent amount of pressure, dab and lift, dab and lift, no scrubbing, just dab and lift across the page to kind of get that cloudy effect. I did go back in at this point and add a little bit more of the Payne's Gray in areas because I wanted some more dimension. You do you though. And of course, let this dry or get a hair dryer or a heat gun and get this bad boy nice and dry before you proceed to the next step. All right, friends, this is step two, the background mountains. I have trouble with this one, friends. I am as impatient as it comes when it comes to my artwork. But trust me, don't skip this step. Going back in with Payne's Gray and I'm going to create a long meandering line that starts kind of in the middle of the page, slightly higher, comes across unevenly and then peaks up into a mountain on that right hand side. Friends, if you don't have Payne's Gray, mix up a little bit of black with a little bit of blue, you'll be good to go. And then add a stroke, a thicker stroke of that color you've used there going across and then clean your brush, rinse your brush really well, go right underneath that darkest line that you've made and let it blend out. Let it blend, blend, blend out. Rinse your brush again, continually rinse your brush because you wanna make sure that you're not dragging down too much pigment towards that bottom third of the page. I did go ahead back in, this is where I deviated from the actual lesson and added a little bit more of my Payne's Gray in areas to really help things punch and pop off the page. All right, there are essentially two layers of mountains, so let's get on to the second one. Get that Payne's Gray out again, and with the tip or point of your brush, you're going to add another mountainous range here. It's going to start about a quarter of the way in from the left, and it's going to quickly arc up towards that tallest mountain. But of course, letting that tallest mountain still remain the tallest. And then you're going to add in some scrubby, ruffly marks at the top edge of this line you just created to kind of create the look of pine trees. There's so many ways that you can create pine tree silhouettes with watercolor. I tend to use my dagger, hold my dagger almost perpendicular at times, create lines, a vertical line, and then a few horizontal lines. I tend to wiggle and scratch my brush. Find a rhythm that works for you. You can even test this out on a scrap piece of paper until you feel comfortable. And then you wanna rinse your brush really well. Go right underneath that range of pine trees that you just added and blendy blend down towards the top of that third, bottom third of the page. I'm gonna deviate again by adding a little bit of like a turquoise green, a few moments of purple, and you could do you at this point. If you don't wanna add the additional color, don't. If you wanna add even more color, do. Uh, I just felt like I wanted a little something, something extra, so there it is. And you guessed it, let it dry. Step number three, we're adding the background village. I'm starting this with kind of a yellow ochre, which is basically just a yellow, mix it with a little, little bit of purple, you'll be good to go. And essentially you're creating kind of a distant appearance of some houses on the hillside. And so they're gonna be lighter, more sheer, so not a lot of pigment, but a whole lot of water. And the shapes aren't gonna be perfectly defined, but the basic shape you're creating is a rectangle 
vertical rectangle and a little triangle on top. That is your house shape. You can bump a couple up next to one another. You can make some super small. Definitely wanna make them smaller as you place them higher on that hilltop. That'll create a little bit of natural perspective. And then I switch up my colors. I've got like a nice cerulean blue here. Well, cerulean-ish. And bringing in some pinky reds and even a little bit of turquoise as I go on. And friends, just notice these shapes aren't very defined. I if, I if I had to give this a ratio of pigment to water, I would say it's about 10% pigment, 90% water on my brush. But also make sure your brush isn't too soggy with water because you're gonna have a hard time controlling the shapes if it is. And let her dry. Okay, remember the basic house shape? Well, we're gonna revisit that. You've got your vertical rectangle with the little triangle on top. I'm gonna to be using, just like Colby did, a range of reds, the yellow ochre, some type of blue. I'm bringing the Payne's Gray back in. Use the colors you love here. The idea is this is kind of a Scandinavian kind of coastal town. I'm sure you've seen those iconic images with those bright colored homes right by the water. Make them the colors you love. Don't feel like you have to follow what I'm doing or what Colby did. All right, so I'm starting kind of putting my house like halfway between that bottom line that delineates from the top two thirds of the page and the bottom third, kind of going halfway in between. And yeah, you're gonna be going over top areas that have already been painted with light color and it's okay. It will all kind of work out in the end, trust me. Some of my houses are skinnier, some are wider, some are a little bit crooked and I'm doing that by design. I'm also taking the opportunity and this is again me deviating from what Colby does in her book, but I'm adding some other shades of the color of the house. So for example, with the red house, I might dab in when the house is still wet, a darker red or with a blue house, a darker blue. So again, this is definitely a great kind of you do you moment. Don't be nervous to let the colors of adjacent houses run together a little bit. I find that to be super interesting. Again, that's deviating from the lesson in the book, but I'm here for it. I love it. I am using the cat's tongue brush here. It's giving me a nice balance of control, but also the kind of brush that holds a decent amount of paint and water. So I think it's the perfect choice. Oh, I love that yellow ochre house right in the middle. I love how it's not just solid watercolor. The Payne's Gray house right next to it, just lovely. I wanna make a note about following these kind of step-by-step -step tutorials because it needs to be said. I actually find them potentially a little stressful. And this is not a commentary on any author because I am also a book author and I have step-by-step -step projects in most of my books. There is a certain kind of heaviness and weight when you're doing a step-by-step -step project, especially from a book where you're just confronted with the perfect imagery of each step it can be stressful. So my tip for anyone working with a specific step-by-step -step tutorial is to find moments throughout that tutorial where you can add your own flair. Essentially seek out moments where you can go rogue without completely reinventing the wheel of the tutorial because that's the point of a step-by-step. -step. There's predictability and you kind of know where you're gonna land. You're gonna be satisfied with where you land if you follow the steps. But I love finding moments where you can embellish and edit, but not so much that you change the end result dramatically. All right, work your way across that, let's call it the horizon line, even though, well, maybe it is, not quite. But anywho, work your way across that landscape, structural, seascape horizon line until all of your houses are added. Just another note here, I really like to vary the width and the height slightly. I don't go crazy, as you can see, as I'm finishing up here, but the variety in these homes is going to give your painting the personality that it's going to need because, 
let's face it, there's a lot of one color in this painting. That's the paint's gray. And I personally think that adding some variety is really helping the overall success of the painting. And a great place to do that is in your little houses. Now, this is an added step that I put in just because of the nature of the way things worked out. I have to go in and backfill essentially some of these distant homes because where I ended my distant homes on the hillside didn't quite line up and make sense with where I put my bold, colorful row of homes. So I'm just going back in with that low concentration of pigment to water on my brush and adding in those distant foggy homes. Step four, the foreground village. Adding the little windows to these houses had to be one of my favorite parts of this entire process. So basically I mixed up a 50-50 ratio of Payne's Gray to water. And I purposely wasn't too exacting or perfect when adding in these windows. Some houses had big wide doors at the bottom of the house. Some had little tiny windows two across. Some had even tinier windows three or four across. And then of course I added in a few of those round windows at the very top of the roof. Loved that detail. But this is a great you do you moment. Okay, this next part was my absolute favorite and that was adding in the white detail. Okay. Let me explain the choices I made here. I wanted a little more dimension. I wanted my houses to feel like they weren't quite as, cartoony isn't the right word, but I guess not quite as graphic. I wanted to like lessen the contrast. So I started by detailing the white around the windows and the doors with a gel pen. And naturally the gel pen kind of sort of mixing with the watercolor and it didn't create a really bright white. I let it dry and settle for a few minutes just to see where the intensity would eventually kind of level off. And then I went back in with my bleed proof white and my liner brush and I used that to add really bright, strong white highlights only. So I didn't use that bright, strong white everywhere and what it did was gave me the most incredible dimension to the row of houses. I also decided to embellish with some extra dots of white from the gel pen and I put a few moments of that gel pen also in the very distant houses. It just added a little bit of sparkle. All right, moving on to one of the last steps here is adding the reflections in the water. So this is the reason why we steered clear of the bottom third of this painting for the entire time. Go ahead and wet this bottom third now, nice even glisten, no puddles. And this is pretty straightforward. Underneath the greenhouse, you're gonna add a little bit of an intense green into the wet watercolor paper and then blend it down. And as you blend it down, you're gonna kind of wave your brush back and forth to create a little bit of texture. Rinse your brush really well, continue on. The next house is Payne's Gray. So at intense Payne's Gray, I actually got a little distracted and excited about that red house, so I skipped right to the red. Add the most intense red right underneath the house, and then rinse your brush out a little bit, blend and wiggle that brush down to the very bottom for a little bit of texture. And basically, friends, just rinse and repeat, and you're gonna see a little bit of mingling between the colors that are adjacent to one another, and that's perfectly fine. When I finished all of the reflections, I rinsed my brush and went back into certain areas with a little bit more color on my brush. So in the red reflection, I got a little bit of fresh red on my brush. My brush is just damp, almost completely dry, and with a light touch, with just the tip of my brush, I added a few squiggles for added dimension and detail. I didn't do that everywhere though, just here and there, because this is a situation where too much could definitely be too much. I mentioned it earlier that I was going back in over top of the gel pen with the bleed proof white to get that strong white contrast. I did that on all of the roof lines cause it just felt right and I love the way it looked. And then I added some highlights to certain windows and whatnot. This is definitely a moment where you decide what feels right. Just try not to overdo it. I know that's really hard to quantify, like what's overdoing it to me might not be the same for you, but I think you get the idea. I also took liberties here and especially where I had painted 
the house over top of a dark part of the distant mountains, right? I mentioned that earlier, that don't worry if you're painting over something and it's maybe gonna show through a little bit. Well, I had some moments like that, but I used the white, a few dashes, a few crosshatch marks to cover up those areas. And I actually love the look so much that I did it even in places that didn't need to be camouflaged a little bit. Last but certainly not least, I went into the water with a heavier hand and more lines towards that kind of water line where the houses met the water. I used heavier lines and more lines. And then as I got away from it, more into the foreground of the water, I used less. It was just the right amount of detail and the whole painting started to sparkle. In the introduction of Colby's book, she says something that I loved. Here it goes. I replaced my expectations and judgment with curiosity and a thirst for exploration. And that's what today's painting session was all about for me. And I hope it's about the same for you. I got way out of my comfort zone. Friends, you know I am not a seascape painting type of gal. But if I've learned anything over the years as a watercolor artist who definitely has a certain style and a certain subject matter she gravitates towards, it's this. Number one, we definitely need to challenge ourselves once in a while. And if that means venturing out into subject matter that makes us uncomfortable, then do it. I'm not gonna lie though, when you head into this kind of challenging territory with subject matter that you're not accustomed to, the risk for being kind of let down with your results is much higher. But friends, please remember, it's just paper and it's just a little bit of time and every brushstroke, no matter how ugly, has something to teach you. Number two, and this is an important one, if you find an artist who paints very different subject matter than you do, but the kind of heart and soul behind their approach really resonates with you, then let them teach you something. Follow a couple of their tutorials because the heart behind how they teach versus what they teach might really open you up to something you couldn't have dreamed. Now next, I've got a Southwestern and a mountainous landscape that I know you're going to love. Let's head over there now. And until next time, friends, happy painting.